What is up guys, it's Conrad back with another video and today in this video we are going to be learning machine learning in just one hour. Or if you have this video on twice the speed, we're going to be learning machine learning in just 30 minutes. And the reason why I created this video, why I created this course, is because I looked around on the internet and I realized that a lot of the introductory machine learning courses are much longer than an hour, yet they don't go over some of the most essential algorithms for performing the most accurate machine learning predictions. So I created this course so that you can go from basic Python knowledge all the way able to being able to use some of the most complex and most useful machine learning algorithms. And I did it all in one video. The course is divided into four different sections. First, we're gonna go over data pre-processing. That is, how do we make sure that our data is correct before we input it into any machine learning model? And we're also going to talk about how to deal with missing values, just stuff like that. Next, we're gonna work with regression algorithms. That is, algorithms that help us, with a given x, predict the y value on a sliding scale. After that, we're gonna work with classification algorithms. That is, we're gonna work with, is it this, is it this, is it this? Problems that deal with stuff like that. Finally, we're going to be working with boosting and we're going to be working with principal component analysis. So these are two techniques that are gonna get your algorithm from here all the way up to here. So that's that final push that a lot of the other machine learning tutorials on the internet don't cover that I wanted to cover in this video. In this course, we're gonna be using Google Colab and the Python library called Scikit-Learn. Scikit-Learn is incredibly powerful and incredibly easy to learn, and it is also included in Google Colab. All the code for this course is on GitHub, so without further ado, guys, let's get started. All right, guys, hello and welcome to the course. In this video, we are going to be working with data pre-processing. So if you already know a little bit about this, feel free to skip, but something that's really important in machine learning is that we have our data properly processed because data is everything when it comes to what we're actually putting into these algorithms. So first, how do you deal with missing data? Now, all the data sets that we're going to be using in this course are all nice and packaged up for you, courtesy of me and Kaggle and Scikit-Learn. But when you get in the real world, you'll find often that you're gonna have missing data. So how do we deal with that? Because the model cannot handle missing data. It will throw an error and it won't work. Well, there are three things that we can do. One, we can remove the feature if let's say most of the points in that feature are missing. Like for instance, if you have something like um, customer satisfaction and you find that only 2% of your customers entered that survey, then maybe that data isn't going to be good for a machine learning model that's using a bunch of data on transactions. Also, you could remove the individual data point. So if the individual data point doesn't really have any information in it, let's say they only filled out one feature, but you have like 10 features, it might just be better to remove the data point. And the third option, if there's only a few missing data points here and there, and uh, overall you feel like that data point can still contribute to the model and overall the features can still contribute to the model, what you're gonna wanna do is you can set the missing value by using the mean or the median of the data set and then input that as the missing value. So the mean would obviously be if you have a data set with a small scale, but if you have numbers that are super, super large and super, super small, it might make more sense to input the missing value as the median. And so right here you can see that is how we do it using Python. And uh, this is pretty simple. I will have a GitHub link down below, and that's where you're gonna find all the code for this course, including there's a notebook called pre-processing, which is gonna have all the code that we have here. Next, dealing with categorical variables. So w something that you're going to notice is that in machine learning, not all variables are going to be just a set number. And so if you have something that's a categorical variable, as in like it's either this or this and it can't be in between, for instance, color, it's either red or it's yellow or it's green, it can't be in between. With that, you're gonna have to convert that column, which would say the word red, red, yellow, green, yellow, and you're gonna have to convert that into these numbers. And so this represents, is it red? Is it yellow? Is it green? And you can see here when we convert it to sort of a binary format, then the model 
is able to deal with categorical variables. So what you're going to do is you're going to do something called one-hot encoding, and it's super, super easy to implement using scikit-learn, and of course you'll have the code here that you can use. Next, we're going to talk about feature scaling. So feature scaling is something that it works sometimes, it doesn't work all the time, but it's at least useful to try depending on the algorithm and the problem that you're using. And so the idea with feature scaling is that if you have two variables, like say population and average age, these two variables are very, very far apart. They're on completely different scales. And that might make it hard for the model to really interpret what's going on. And so what we do is we scale the features by taking, essentially, if you've taken statistics, the new x is going to be equal to the initial x minus the minimum x and then the max minus the min. And you can also just take the z-score, but the idea is that we get all of the variables on the same scale. So just to sort of visualize this, if you can think, if we have a variable y and a variable x, and they're directly correlated to each other, this line right here, this red line, is going to be what the correlation is going to look like. However, if you have a variable y and a variable x that is only one-tenth of the way correlated, like let's say the y is 10 times as big as the x, then that means that you're going to get a correlation like this blue line. And the idea is that for the model sometimes, if it has a stronger correlation like this red line, it's going to be able to perform more accurate predictions than if it has a weaker correlation like this blue line. And so in order to do feature scaling in scikit-learn, all you're gonna have to do is import your standard scalar and then set your x equal to scalar.fitstransform x. Last and most importantly, we're going to talk about choosing features. So when you're choosing features, it's really important that you don't have any miscellaneous features. So for instance, there might be an ID column that just contains the ID of the data point. You don't need to worry about that. Uh, some things to note, you never, never, never want to have more features than you have data points. Uh, you may say, wait, how would that be possible? I'm going to have like, you know, 10 features and a thousand data points and that's true for a lot of instances but sometimes when you get to stuff like sentiment analysis and you're working with words your features could be is it this word is it this word is it this word and you can get um, more features than you have data points and so that's a big 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 no-no also you need to make sure that your features are correlated to the output the idea behind machine learning is that we're trying to from initial conditions find an output value so if the variables are completely unrelated, like, okay, um, let's try to predict someone's weight based on, you know, what time they woke up. Okay, something random like that. If you just have a bunch of miscellaneous features, then the model isn't going to be able to perform strong predictions. Also, you want to make sure that the features are not too related to other features, because if you do that, the model is going to overfit. And basically what overfitting is when the model is really, really accurate on the data that you give it, but if you give it new data, it doesn't really work well on the new data because it's so used to the old data that I was training on. And so when you have features that are very, very closely related to each other, uh, you can basically trick the model into making itself super, super accurate on the test set. So you want different features that aren't directly related. So an instance of that would be like if you had one feature that was time in seconds, and then another feature that was th that same time, but in hours instead. That wouldn't be helpful to your model because those two features are redundant and it's going to most likely make your model overfit. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for this video. Remember, all the code for this course is on GitHub. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave me a message down below. And I'll see you next time where we're gonna work with regression, sweet. All right, guys, so now that you've learned data pre-processing, it's time to start with regression. And basically, with regression problems, you're going to be looking for things where you have a sliding value, something like height, something like weight, something like price, something that's on a scale, that's a sliding value, not something that's, say, categorical, like, you know, either this is a mouse or this is a cup. It's not somewhere in between. Whereas with price, you can have stuff in between. And that's what we're going to use regression for. Regression is a way for us to, given a set of values, try to predict another set of values. So put simply, 
the easiest and simplest, most vanilla regression algorithm out there is going to be simple linear regression. And this algorithm is super easy, super fast, and actually pretty helpful in a wide variety of circumstances. Basically, you have an X, you have a Y, you have a scatter plot of data, and then what you wanna do is you wanna plot the line of best fit so that given a new data point, you can predict that data point's X or Y. And so just to show you what I mean, what we are going to be doing is we are going to be predicting the heights of sons based on the height of their fathers. So as we all know, intelligence is hereditary, which means that uh, father height and son height are going to be correlated. So if you go to Kaggle, or I've also pre-processed this data and it's in the GitHub for this course, you can see here that we have father and we have son. So we have the father height and the son height. And what we want to do here is we want to predict the line of best fit so that given the height of say the father, we can then predict about where the son's height is going to be. And this is a really powerful, really interesting implementation of linear regression. So let's get to it. The first thing that we're going to do is connect our runtime. So I'll let Google Colab do that. And then while it's doing that, we need to upload our data. And remember, you can get the data from the GitHub or you can pre-process it yourself. This is in a TXT format and I converted it to a CSV format, which is going to be easier for the algorithm to read in. So if we just upload father son height.csv into our runtime, now what we can do is finally get our data set and import it into Colab. So the first thing we're gonna say is import pandas as PD, and pandas is going to handle our data for us. We'll say our data set is going to equal to pd.read underscore CSV, and we are going to input the father son height dot csv okay so now that we have that done what we need to do is we need to get an x and a y so if we open up our father son height csv here in colab you can see we have father and we have son so that's two columns and we have about a thousand entries so all we have to do here is we'll say our x value and we'll say it's equal to data set and inside the square brackets, we're going to input the string father because that is the name of the father column. And we're gonna say dot values. And then our Y is going to be equal to data set son dot values. So our X is the father height. And then from the height of the father, we want to predict the height of that father's son. Awesome, so we'll run that. Looks like everything went well. Next, what we're going to do is build the linear regression model. In order to do that, we're gonna say from sklearn dot linear model, we're going to import linear regression. All right, sweet. So now all we have to do is create the model. And since we're gonna have multiple models in this collab file, I'm going to name our model lin underscore reg, and we're gonna set that equal to linear regression with open parentheses. Now, all we have to do to train our model is say linreg.fit, and we are going to fit our x to our y. So we'll run that. Ah, and you see right here we have an error. It says we need to reshape, reshape our data either using array.reshape or um, doing something else. And so this is actually a very common error in Colab. You'll get this and it's super easy to fix. All you have to do is just copy this and then we are going to apply this to one of our data sets. So I'll apply it to the X value. And basically the idea behind this is that our data is either like this or this, but we need it to be like this and this and this and this. Basically all we're doing is we're just flipping our data so that it's horizontal instead of vertical or vice versa. So we'll run the data set, and then now you see our model works fine. Now what we need to do is we need to plot it out. So in order to plot it, first what we're gonna do is we're gonna import matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and let's just see what our data set looks like without the linear regression line running through it. So we're gonna say plt.scatter, and we're gonna scatter, we're gonna have the x, 
we're going to have the Y and our color is going to be equal to blue and then we'll just say plt dot show so as you can see right here we have the height of a father and then we have the height of a son here and you can obviously see that there is a correlation albeit not a very strong correlation between father and son as we know you can't perfectly predict the height of a child based on the height of their father but there definitely is a correlation here and what our linear regression model is doing is it's plotting the line of best fit that most perfectly matches this data set of the correlation between father and son. And so in order to get our line to show up, what we're going to say is we're going to say plt.scatter, or excuse me, plt.plot, and we are going to plot x for the x value. And the y value, instead of being our known y's, we're going to have our predicted y's. So we're going to say lin reg dot predict and we are going to predict x and then let's also make the color equal to red because I'll show up nice on the blue and then we'll make the line width equal to 4 and if we run that you can see we have our linear regression line going through the scatter plot and you can see here that this is a pretty good representation of our data albeit it's not perfect but then again the data is pretty messy so that's to be expected now you may be wondering okay that's great but what if our data is not just a straight line what if our data would better be fit if it was you know more like a curvy line and for that we're going to need to do polynomial regression so in mathematics if we go to Desmos um, you have the idea of polynomials and polynomial degrees. So for instance, right now what we have is we have a linear model. So we have y equals x. Now what if our data is more complex than that? What we have to do is we have to raise the degree of our x. So like x squared or x to the third or x to the fourth, x to the fifth, etc, etc, etc. Now in order to do that, it's really, really simple. All we have to do is say from sklearn.preprocessing, we're going to import our polynomial features. Then from there, we're just going to say poly is equal to, and we'll say polynomial features. And then inside here, we'll set the degree equal to what we want our degree to be. So for instance, for a simple uh, hoopy shape, I know it has an actual name. We'll set it to two, and then as our model, if our data is more complex, we'll keep on raising the degree and see which degree works best on the data set. But as you can see right here, we'll just set degree equal to two, and we'll say x poly underscore poly is going to be equal to uh, poly dot fit underscore transform, and we're going to transform the x so that it is now. Uh, polynomially present, represented. Now after that we're going to say poly.fit and we're going to fit x underscore poly to the y. Now we need to train our linear regression model on this new uh, polynomial data set. So to do that we're going to say lin underscore reg underscore poly it's going to be equal to linear regression and then lin underscore reg underscore poly dot fit and we're going to fit the x poly to the y so we'll run that okay it looks like our model worked now all we have to do is represent it so if I copy this code right here and then paste it down here all I have to do is instead of saying linreg.predict, we're going to say linregpoly.predict, and then instead of predicting the x, we are going to predict the poly.fit underscore transform of x. So we'll run that, and it's a little bit hard to see, but you can tell that at the 
uh, far ends, our curve flattens out a bit. So it's not just a straight line. And if we say raise the degree even higher, like let's say to the power of four, you can see that the curve is a little bit exacerbated where it gets a lot thicker towards the top as it sort of starts to level off. All right, that's great. But you may be wondering now, what if we don't just have an X and a Y? What if we have several X's and we only need to predict one Y or some combination of that? And in order to do that, you're not gonna be able to graphically represent the X and the Y here on the scatter plot. Well, at least not until the very end of the course, but you're still able to perform linear regression and see how accurate your data is. And so this is where we get into the concept of multiple linear regression. And for that, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be predicting graduate admission data, that is uh, admission to a graduate school program based on several factors. So I have here also from Kaggle a data set that I've pre-processed a bit called admission data, and it's in the GitHub along with everything else. And you can see right here, we have a bunch of X's like GRE score, university ranking, all that stuff. And then the Y that we're trying to predict is the chance of admission. Now we could make this a classification problem by saying if they got in, then they're in the admission category. And if they didn't, then they're in the rejected category. But instead you see here, we have a sliding scale of how likely they are to get in. And so that's what makes this a regression problem rather than a classification problem. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to import our data set. So I'm going to re-import all the libraries just in case you guys are coming back later and resetting your Kaggle runtime. So we'll say import pandas as PD and we'll say our data set will now equal pd.read underscore CSV. And we're going to read the admission data.csv. All right, great. Now we set the X and the Y. And in order to do that, we're gonna do something a little bit different than what we did when we had just two variables. We're gonna say X is going to equal to data set dot I lock, that's I L O C. And then we're gonna open up square brackets. We're gonna have just a colon, empty colon. And then here we're gonna have our values. So what we want for the X is we want from the zeroth attribute all the way to the zero, one, two, three, four, five, sixth attribute. And then the seventh will be our Y. So we'll say zero colon six. And of course we want to put dot values at the end of that. And then our Y will be equal to data set dot, well, data set dot I lock and we'll say empty colon and then just seventh dot values for the last chance of admit column right there. So we'll run that. And now, uh, as I told you before, we're not gonna be able to graphically represent this because we have multiple X's and just one Y and we can't see into six dimensions with our eyes, unfortunately, at this point in time. So in order to see how accurate our model is going to be, what we're going to do is we're going to train on part of the data, but then set another part of the data aside. And this data will be the testing data. The idea is that we don't want our model to know the data set really, really well, but then when it's given a new example, it has no idea how to generalize what it learns, and then it fails. And that's what this testing data is for. It's a little piece of data that's set aside that is meant to check if the model isn't overfitting. That is, if the model doesn't just really know the particular data points that it was given and um, can't generalize. And especially since we have a smaller data set, that means that we're much more prone to overfitting. We're much more prone to the model being inaccurate. So in order to fix that, what we're going to do is we're going to have to split the data set. And luckily, Scikit-learn makes this super, super easy. And even if you're not using Scikit-learn, most people use Scikit-learn just for this feature. And that is to split a training data and a testing data up for us. So we're gonna say from sklearn.model underscore selection, we're gonna import train test split. 
And then we're going to have our X train and our X test, our Y train and our Y test. Make sure that they're set equal to each other in this order. That's going to be equal to train test split. And we're going to say our X, our Y, and the test size is going to be equal to 0.2 or 20% of the data. Now, since we have 500 entries, that means that 100 data points will be set aside for testing the accuracy of our model. 20% uh, is pretty normal. That's like the industry standard. If you have a lot of data points, then you can uh, make it higher. If you have a little bit, of data points then you might want to make it lower it really just depends but generally you want the test data to be a good representation of the total training data without um, with the training data still having enough to train on and usually that number is around 20 percent or 0.2 of the data set all right so with that being said let's run it and now what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing with polynomial features that we did above and we're just going to do it on multiple values so we'll say from sklearn dot preprocessing import polynomial features and we'll say multi underscore poly is going to equal to polynomial features and we'll set the degree at first just equal to two and then we'll say x underscore poly is going to be equal to multi underscore poly dot fit underscore transform and we are going to transform the x train next what we're going to do is we're going to say multi underscore poly oops I forgot a period there multi underscore poly dot fit and we're going to fit the x poly to the y train now that we have that done, and it looks like everything ran okay, we're going to create our linear regression model. So we'll just say lin underscore reg underscore multi for multiple linear regression. It's going to equal to linear regression, empty parentheses, and then lin underscore reg underscore multi dot fit. And we're going to fit our x poly to our Y train. Okay, so it looks like our model is sufficiently trained. Now, obviously, we can't graph it, so how can we tell how accurate our model is? Now, there are several ways to do this in linear regression. Uh, one way is to calculate the mean squared error. That is the difference between our predicted value and our actual value squared. And so this is just going to give us sort of a baseline of how far off our model is. So something like this where the data points are all over the place, this is going to have a very, very high mean squared error because you can imagine a data point that's all the way as an outlier. You take th the distance between this from the line and then, you know, square that. It's, it's, it's going to add up over time. But luckily with this graduate admissions, we have a lot more features and uh, we can more accurately, more accurately predict our chance of admission. So in order to show our mean squared error, what we're first going to do is we're going to get our predictions value. So we're going to say y underscore preds, which is short for prediction, is going to equal lin reg multi dot predict. And we're going to predict the multi underscore poly dot fit underscore transform. And we're going to do it on X test. So these are values that the model has never seen before. Fit transform X test. And then we'll say SK learn import metrics. And then here we'll just print, we'll print out metrics dot mean underscore squared underscore error. And we're going to show the difference between our y underscore test and our y underscore preds. Because remember, we have the original value for what y is supposed to be in our 
Y test. So we'll run that and you can see our loss is 0 0.0005, which is, which is a, it's a pretty good loss. It's a little bit hard to tell with the lack of data that we have, but that's pretty decent. Let's see if we can improve it by changing the degree of polynomial features. So let's say three, and unfortunately polynomial features, that's just something that you're gonna have to work out on your own. There's no real way to sort of map the correlation in your head. Um, I think that went up, now let's try four. As you can see, four is taking longer to train on the data set. But we'll run it anyways. And it looks like two is the best because if I recall correctly, if we just go back to two, yeah, two is 0 0.005 and the other ones were like 0 0.009. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for the basic regression techniques. You now know how to do simple linear regression, how to map polynomial features, and how to add multiple X and Y features to predict a particular Y value. But yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one where we'll be working with classification, which is a little bit more popular in machine learning, I'd say. Sweet. All right, guys, so we did some regression problems. Now it's time to work with classification. And in case you forgot, classification is when we don't have any objects, any values on a sliding scale. We either have something that is something or it isn't something. So in this example, we are going to be taking a look at a data set of breast cancer tumors and determining whether or not they are malignant or benign. So you can imagine this problem is hugely important because it can save lives and help doctors save time as well. So the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to connect to our collab runtime. And once it's connected, we're going to press upload and we are going to upload our cancer data set, which is called cancer CSV. All right, now that we have that, let's take a look at our data set. So if we open it up here, you see we have the ID, which is basically, you don't have to worry about that. It doesn't have anything to do with the machine learning that we're going to be doing. And then we have the diagnosis, which is M for malignant or B for benign. And then we have our radius mean, texture mean, and all these other data points about all these other features of a given tumor. And then from that, we are going to try to predict if that tumor is malignant or if it is benign. So let's import our data into Colab. First we'll say import pandas as PD. And then we will set our data set equal to pd.read underscore CSV. And we will say cancer.csv because that's the name of our file. And then also remember we have to split our data into the X and the Y. Now, as you can see, there are a lot of features and I don't feel like counting them all. So I'm just going to print the length of the data set dot columns. And that will show us that we have 32 columns. So 32 columns, that means 31 indexes and we don't need the ID index and we don't need the diagnosis because that's going to be our Y variable. So that means that X is going to equal to dataset.iloc and we're going to have just a colon and then we're going to go from the second value, 0, 1, 2, which is radius mean, all the way up to the 29th value. And of course we're going to put dot values at the end of this as well. And then let's also set up our Y variable. Our Y variable is equal to data set dot I lock. And it is just going to be the first column, which is to say the second column because we have zero and then one. And I'll put dot values there. I'll run that. Okay, all is Gucci. So next it's time to do train test split. And it's really important to note that we need a training set and a testing set even more so for classification problems because something like misclassifying a tumor can be a matter of life and death. So being able to make sure that our model isn't just overfitting on our data and just understands our data really well but doesn't understand new data is really, really important. So we're going to say from 
sklearn dot model underscore selection. We are going to import our train test split, and then we're going to say the x train, the x test, the y train, and the y test are equal to train underscore test underscore split our x and y and we are also going to set our test underscore size equal to 0 0.2 or 20 percent of our data which for 569 entries means that we'll have a little more than 100 entries saved for testing our model so i'll run that looks like all's good next what we're going to be doing is we are going to scale our data so as you can see some of these numbers are all over the place for instance you have numbers in the hundreds and then numbers in the point ones and if you think of in a graph if you have one variable say like the x2 variable that's super super big and the other variable isn't then you're going to it's going to be harder to see a correlation what you want is you want all the variables to have a similar scale so that it's easier to find that correlation, that line of best fit. You basically want to exacerbate the features of the model and how they are related to each other. And so in order to do that, we do scaling. So we're going to say from sklearn.preprocessing, we're going to import our standard scalar, and then we're gonna set scalar equal to standard scalar and then we are also going to say our x train is going to equal to scalar dot fit underscore transform x train and we'll do the same thing with our x test and this will basically just ensure that our model um, can understand the data and doesn't get too confused with the numbers being all over the place if we put all the numbers on a set scale, it's going to be easier for the model to draw conclusions. So we'll say x test is equal to scalar.fit transform x test. Great, so we'll run that. So now that our data is scaled, it's time to do logistic regression. And you might say, hold up, regression was the last section of this course. Shouldn't we be doing something with classification in the name? And I understand that that's confusing, but logistic regression is actually a classification algorithm. And the reason for that is that if you look at the image on the screen, what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict if a tumor is malignant or benign. So if it's zero or if it's one. And as you can see here, we can actually use linear regression to solve this problem. However, it doesn't work very well because linear regression is supposed to work on sliding values, right? And obviously a tumor is either malignant or benign. It's never gonna be in between. And so because of that, we do logistic regression, which does the same thing as linear regression, but it takes into account the fact that those values in the middle right there, we don't have to account for them. We don't need a straight line. We need a curvy line to show the differences between zero and one. And so with that being said, it's time to import our logistic regression model. So we'll say from sklearn.linear underscore model, we're going to import logistic regression. And then now we are going to set our model equal to logistic underscore classifier. And we'll say logistic classifier is equal to logistic regression, empty parentheses. And then we'll just say logistic classifier dot fit. And we will fit our X train to our Y train. All right, so I'll run that. And something that's important to note here is that if you notice, we've been leaving our parentheses blank when we uh, make the model. And because of, that's because we haven't been putting in any hyperparameters. If you see here, these are the default parameters that are assumed when we put nothing in the parentheses here. However, if you want to make your model more and more accurate, uh, it's nice to sort of play around with some of these parameters and see if you can make your model more accurate. Now, luckily, the scikit-learn documentation is really good at explaining what each of these different parameters does. So I'm gonna leave some links down below so that you can sort of work that out and figure out uh, what each of these parameters mean if your model just isn't 
as accurate as you want it to be. With that being said, it's now trying to see how accurate our model actually is. So what we're going to do is we are going to set Y preds and we're going to set our predictions equal to logistic classifier dot predict and we are going to predict the X test values. And of course, we have the Y test values as well. So we just show the two, we just compare the two and we'll be able to see how accurate our model is. And so in order to do that, we're just going to say from sklearn dot metrics we are going to import the confusion matrix. And the confusion matrix is hugely important because what it's going to show is it's not just going to show how accurate our model is, but it's going to show how many examples our model misclassifies and what types of misclassification uh, our model is performing. So just to sort of show you what I mean, we're going to print out our confusion matrix and the confusion matrix parameters are going to be the Y test and of course our Y preds. So let's print out the confusion matrix. And you can see right here, you get two columns and two rows. And basically these two data points, the 69 and the 42, represent the number of correct predictions and these represent the number of false predictions. So what a confusion matrix does is it gives you a little bit more info on what exactly your model is misclassifying and what your model is getting right. So up here, this represents the number of uh, positive values that were predicted to be positive. This represents the number of negative values that were predicted to be negative. So since these numbers are both very high, that means that our model is pretty accurate in that sense. Now, over here, this one means that the model predicted that a value was positive but in actuality, it was negative. And this right here means that the model predicted that a value was negative, but it was actually positive. So in something like cancer classification, this is really, really important. Because if your model is predicting that a bunch of tumors are benign when they are actually malignant, uh, that's much worse than if your model is predicting that a bunch of tumors are malignant when actually they are benign. Because at that point, you know, the worst that could happen is you maybe get an extra checkup versus having a tumor grow into a more cancerous tumor and then eventually kill you. So that's why it's printing your confusion matrix is important because there are lives at stake, people. Okay, so going away from that, we are now going to talk about support vector machines. And support vector machines are hugely popular in classification problems. You can also use them for regression problems. In fact, all the algorithms that we're talking about from this point on, you can use for regression as well. Um, but we're just going to use them for classification because that's generally what they are used for. So in support vector machines, what you're trying to do is the model is trying to group individual data points such that the distance between them is as far as possible. And this is a really cool concept and the math behind this is pretty advanced. I'm not going to explain it now. As always, I'll have resources for you guys to look and uh, learn on your own if you wish. But if not, you can just implement the algorithm in like three lines of Python, which is pretty awesome. So let's import, say from sklearn.svm. We're going to import svc. And then we're going to set our svm for a support vector machine equal to svc. And then inside of here, we actually are not going to leave this empty. We are going to add a kernel, and that kernel is going to be equal to RBF. And this sort of goes in with the kernel trick, which of course I'll also leave resources for, but um, this is just a hyperparameter that we're going to be playing around with. Of course, you can do whatever you like. You can get rid of the kernel, whatever you want, but just for this example, we're going to be using a kernel, just to show you that it works. And now if you wanted to make a support vector machine for something other than a classification problem, like a regression problem, instead of importing SVC for support vector classification, you would import SVR for support vector regression. That's important to note. Next, what we're going to do is we are going to call svm.fit, and we are going to fit our X train to our Y train. All right, so we'll run that bad boy. And you can see right here under kernel, it says RBF because we passed in kernel as being RBF. Sweet. 
So now it's time to print the confusion matrix. What we're gonna do here is we're going to copy these values and we're gonna paste them here. And instead of doing our logistic classifier.predict, we're going to say svm.predict and that should be it. So we'll run that. And you can see right here, we get the exact same result. Now it's important to note that because our test data is pretty small, it's only about a 100 entries, uh, you're not gonna see too much difference between these algorithms. But as the data sets that you're working with become more complex, have more features, uh, more complex patterns between each other, and more importantly are larger, uh, the types of algorithms that you're using are going to generate vastly different results. But overall, support vector machines do work better than logistic regression. Now obviously if the problem is really simple, it'd be easier just to use the logistic regression classifier because it's just you know, very simple, not gonna take a lot of processing power. You don't want to reinvent the wheel and just make a super hard, elegant solution to a really simple problem. And with that being said, it's on to decision trees. And now decision trees are something that you've probably heard of or used or thought about outside of machine learning. And basically the idea is that you want to break up actions and features, and then at the bottom you'll have different classifications. So an example that's popping up on your screen is let's say you want to make a decision tree for deciding if uh, a person is fit or unfit. So you would say, okay, does that person eat a lot of fast food? Then if it's yes, then they're unfit. If it's no, then they are fit. Same thing with if they exercise regularly. If they exercise regularly, then they're fit. If not, they're unfit. So that's a very basic example. But a lot of companies use decision trees uh, to map out more complex features and map out more complex trees of what a data set is trying to show when they're trying to classify new data points. And so that was a little bit of a wordy explanation, but hopefully you guys sort of get the general idea of what a decision tree is doing. And basically in order to implement our decision tree, all we're gonna say is from sklearn.tree we're going to import our decision tree classifier. And as you've noticed, of course, we can also do decision tree regression, which isn't very common, but it does actually work surprisingly well, I found. Uh, generally at the bottom, you know, you're gonna wanna have your classification, like it's this class, it's this class, it's this class, at the bottom of your decision tree, which is why we're going to be using decision trees for a classification example rather than a regression example. Okay, so now let's make our model. We'll call it tree, and tree will equal decision tree classifier, and our criterion will equal to entropy. So that means that our criteria will be focused on the entropy of the model. Uh, that's just a hyperparameter that we're going to be adjusting. Uh, finally, we're gonna call tree.fit, and we're gonna fit the x-train to the Y train. All right, so we've run that. You can see right here that our criterion is equal to entropy, and now it's time to print out the confusion matrix. So I'm gonna copy and paste the same code from above. Looks like I copied too much. And instead of Ypreds doing svm.predict, it's going to be doing tree.predict. So we'll run that, and you see here, this one decision tree is actually less accurate than our support vector machine and less accurate than our logistic regression example. And the reason for that is that one tree alone is not very strong. So if you think to those competitions that they have, well, they'll have a certain amount of items in a jar, and you have to predict how many items are in that jar. Something that's really interesting about human intuition is that each prediction will be pretty far off but if you add up all those predictions and then divide them by the number of people who made those predictions, you'll find that you get a number that's very close to how many items are in that jar. And so that's something that's really cool about human intuition that also applies to machine learning. One tree is not going to be very strong, but if you have a forest of trees, then it's going to be a much stronger model. 
and that is the idea from random forest classification. And this is getting into what we would call ensemble learning. The idea behind ensemble learning is that you create a bunch of weak models and then if you combine them together you can make a really really strong model. And that's what we're going to get to a little bit in the next video when we talk about optimization. But for now we're just going to give you a taste of what's to come by creating a random forest. And basically a random forest is just a bunch of decision trees. You add up their predictions, divide them by the number of trees, and then you're going to get a more accurate prediction. So we'll say from sklearn.ensemble, we are going to import our random forest classifier. And remember, you can do a random forest regressor too if your problem is a regression problem. And we'll say forest equals random forest classifier. And our number of estimators or number of trees is going to be equal to, let's just start out with 100 trees. And our criterion will be equal to entropy. And it's important to note, decision trees are extremely powerful, but unlike some of the other uh, algorithms, classification algorithms that we've worked with, they are prone to overfitting, which is why it's important that we have a test set so that we can make sure that our algorithm doesn't really understand our data set well, but not understand new data points. So we'll set criterion equal to entry, and we'll just say forest.fit, and we'll fit the x train to the y train. We'll run that. Okay, everything looks Gucci. And now it's time to see if our random forest is any more accurate than our singular decision tree. So I'll run that instead of tree.predict, we'll say forest.predict. We'll run that. And you can see now instead of five incorrect predictions, we only have four incorrect predictions. So you can see that between each of these examples, the actual gained accuracy is rather marginal, and that has more to do with the data set and the size of the data set and the testing set than the actual algorithm. But you can see overall, our support vector machine performed the best as well as our logistic regression classifier. However, our random forest did not perform as well for this particular problem. Some problems, you'll find that the random forest works better. Generally, you're going to want to use a support vector machine there are some problems with support vector machines, but overall support vector machine is probably the best classification algorithm that we've looked at up until when we get to the next video, which is optimization. And with optimization, we're really going to dive in to ensemble learning and we're going to see how powerful it can be and also how quickly you can build a model with ensemble learning versus just doing something like deep learning. So yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for this video and I will see you in the next one. Sweet. All right, guys, it's time for the final and most exciting part of our course. And in this video, we are going to be working with optimization. So you sort of had the basics for some of the really popular machine learning algorithms. Now it's time to take those algorithms to the max and really push the accuracy on how well we can predict cancer based on several different factors. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to connect to our runtime and we're going to upload our cancer data set. And here's our breast cancer data set. And we're gonna do some pre-processing. So we're gonna say import pandas as PD. We're gonna say data set is equal to B dot read underscore CSV cancer dot CSV. And then we're going to set the x equal to, if you remember from the last video, data set dot i lock. And we're going to do colon and then from 2 to 29 dot values. And the y is going to equal to data set dot i lock. <clears throat> and we're going to have 1 right there dot values. All right, see, so we'll run that. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do our train test split so that we'll have a test set to test how accurate our model is. So we'll say from sklearn 
dot model underscore selection. We are going to import the train test split and we're going to say x train x test y train y test equal to train test split our x our y and we'll set our test size equal to 0 0.2 so we'll have 20 percent of the data set aside for testing okay so we'll run that looks like everything went smoothly and now if you remember at the very beginning the pre-processing part of our course we talked about scaling so we're going to see if we can improve the accuracy of our model by scaling all of our values so that they're on the same spectrum and in order to do that it's really really simple with scikit-learn we're going to say from sklearn dot pre processing we are going to import we're going to import standard scalar and then we're just going to say our scalar is equal to the standard scalar and then we're going to say our x train is going to equal to scalar dot fit transform our x train and we're going to do the same thing for our x test so x test is going to be equal to scalar dot fit underscore transform x test so I'll run that and now you can see that all of our values are scaled so if I print out let's say x train you can see here all the values are in a certain range Okay, so now that we have that done, it's time to work with our first way of optimizing. And we are going to do something called principal component analysis. And in principal component analysis, if you noticed our cancer data set, we have a lot of different features of our model. Now, principal component analysis is going to do is it's going to take those features and it's going to reduce them. So how does it reduce the features? Well, if you remember with linear regression, we had two variables, we had an X and a Y, and we wanted to try to predict new variables based on the correlation between those two data points. And that's essentially what we're doing in principal component analysis. Now given in principal component analysis, you are measuring the direct distance from the line versus in linear regression, you are measuring the vertical distance away from the line. And what we're gonna do is if we have two variables that are highly correlated, what we can do is we can say, okay, so all of these, these two variables, the correlation is represented by a line, as you see here. Now, if it's represented by this line, we don't need to have the X and the Y. We can just have the X as a scalar value because we don't have to worry about direction anymore. And so that's basically how you can reduce dimensions. And it's super, super easy to implement and you can get higher accuracy on your model if you have a lot of correlated features. And also, if your data set's really large, this can help to reduce the dimensionality of your data set. So this is really, really useful. What we're gonna do in here is we're gonna take all of these features and we're going to reduce them to just two dimensions. And by doing that, we can perform just simple logistic regression that we can actually print a graph out of. So we'll say from sklearn, dot decomposition we're going to import PCA for principal component analysis and then we're going to say PCA is equal to PCA and our number of components will just equal one so we'll take all of our X values and then just turn them into one single data point so we'll say our X underscore train underscore scaled is going to equal to PCA dot fit transform X underscore train and now just to sort of show you what I mean you see up here we have all these different values if we print our X underscore train underscore scaled and let's just print let's say the first 10 values you can see right here that we've taken all these features and reduced them to just two features. 
All right, so now that we have all of our x variables in one single feature, it's time to do some basic logistic regression. So first, let's just plot out our x and our y. So we'll just say import matplotlib.pyplot as plt. We're going to say plt.scatter. And we're going to have the x train scaled and the y train. And then we'll run plt.show. Enter that. And you can see here, we could easily perform logistic regression on this. You can clearly tell that there is a boundary here where it goes from 0 to 1. Now, obviously, we have reduced the dimensions so much that this isn't going to be a very accurate model. For instance, this whole area right here is in congruence with this area down here. So we're going to get some inaccurate predictions. But we could make a very simple version of logistic regression using just two variables, just an x and a y, which I think is crazy. OK, so now that we have that done, it's time to work with gradient boosting. And so, so far, the algorithms that we've used for machine learning are pretty vanilla. What gradient boosting does is, if we go back to ensemble learning that we learned about in the last video, it's going to make a bunch of different models and then using something called gradient descent, which you'll learn about if you take my Keras course where we work with neural networks, it's going to use gradient descent to try to find the best model. And it's going to take different features from different tinier models and then combine them all together at the end to form one massive, very accurate model. And so for gradient boosting, we're just going to say from sklearn.ensemble we're going to import our gradient boosting classifier. I remember you can also do this for regression, of course. And gradient boost, which is what we're going to call our model, is going to be equal to gradient boosting classifier. As always, you could adjust the hyperparameters if you wish. And we're going to say gradient boost.fit. And we're going to fit our x train to our Y train. OK, so let's run that. Next, what we're going to do is we are going to print out our confusion matrix and see how well our algorithm works on the test set. So we're going to say Y preds is equal to gradient boost dot predict. And we're going to predict the X test. And then we're going to say from sklearn dot metrics import confusion matrix and then we're going to print the confusion matrix of the y test in comparison to the y preds so we'll print that out and you can see we don't misclassify any here and we get six classifications wrong here so overall that's a pretty good improvement of our model. And if we run this multiple times on multiple different uh, test sets, we're going to get different values from this. But you can see pretty quickly we get a fairly accurate model. So now what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to do extreme gradient boosting. And extreme gradient boosting is pretty similar to regular gradient boosting, except extreme gradient boosting has a couple of hyperparameters adjusted. And as always, if you're interested in how that all works, um, people who are better at explaining it than me have done so below, and I've put them in the description for you to check out. But something that's really cool about XG boost or extreme gradient boosting is that it wins more Kaggle competitions than any other algorithm. So this is an extremely, extremely powerful algorithm, and it's also extremely simple compared to some very complex neural networks that would usually win a Kaggle competition. And all you have to do to import XGBoost is just say imp from XGBoost, because it's a separate library, which is already installed in uh, Colab for us, luckily. We're going to import the XGB classifier. And then we're just going to say XGBoost is equal to XGB classifier. No hyperparameters for now. And we're going to say xgboost.fit. 
and we're going to fit our x train to our y train. All right, so let's run that sucker. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to do the same thing with the confusion matrix. So I'll copy that, paste it into here, and instead of gradient boost.predict, we will say xgboost.predict. So we'll run that, and you see this only makes four mistakes, whereas the other one made six. So that's a pretty marginal, it seems like pretty marginal gain in improvement, but still, we have an extremely accurate model. And just like that, you guys have worked with gradient boosting and you've worked with com principal component analysis. You know how to make many different models. You know how to make those models more accurate. You know how to deal with the test set. You know how to make sure that your data set is correct for the problem that you've tried to solve. And you've really come a long way. So pat yourself on the back. And now it is time for our extra credit assignment. And in the extra credit assignment, I want to show you what a difference makes if we don't do standard scaling. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run over the data set again. And we are not going to run this cell with the standard scaling. So if you see we run that, you see we have all sorts of different values. And we're going to see what happens if we don't scale the data set. So first, let's see what happens with principal component analysis. And you can see right here, there is actually a little bit more overlap between the X and the Y than there was before, although not too bad. Now if we run gradient boosting, you can see we get actually a little bit more accurate for gradient boosting. And if we do extreme gradient boosting, we get an even more accurate prediction. So something that's important with transforming, with scaling your values, is that sometimes it doesn't work. It really depends on the problem. If you wanna get a little more accuracy, it's worth a shot. But like as we've seen right here, sometimes it doesn't work because we have reduced our errors by half for the extreme gradient boosting and by two thirds for the regular gradient boosting just by getting rid of transforming and scaling the values. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for this video and I hope to see you in the next one. Sweet, congratulations.